Welcome to NTD News. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at today's top stories. North Korea issues its first statement directed at the new U.S. administration, and it's not a warm welcome. We'll hear how U.S. officials respond. Did Governor Cuomo's office obstruct the probe into nursing home virus deaths? One senator on the Judiciary Committee wants to find out. A professor at the University of Vermont pushes back against critical race theory. He describes the backlash he's faced since speaking out, but says it's important to stand your ground. And a new drop from Project Veritas. This undercover video shows a top Facebook official saying the company has too much power. All that and more on NTD News. North Korea directs its first public statement to the U.S. since Biden took office. Biden officials say North Korea has not responded to their requests for dialogue. North Korea greets the new U.S. administration with a threat, saying, quote, If it wants to sleep in peace for the coming four years, it had better refrain from causing a stink at its first step. That's from Kim Yo-jong. She's the influential sister of the North Korean leader. She says U.S. and South Korea joint military exercises are a threat to North Korea. The U.S. and South Korea hold the exercises every year. The statement comes as high-level Biden officials arrive in Japan. They're there to discuss security in the region. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the Biden administration wants to talk with North Korea. He says they have been trying for a month. To reduce the risks of, um, of escalation, uh, we reached out uh, to uh, the North Korean government through several channels starting in mid-February, uh, including in New York. To date, we have not received a response from Pyongyang. Blinken says the Biden administration wants to work with allies to create safety and security in the region. We're united uh, in the vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region, where countries follow the rules, cooperate whenever they can, and resolve their differences peacefully. Blinken and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin are heading to South Korea for official talks Wednesday. Kim Yo-jong says she will watch the, quote, attitude and actions of the South Korean authorities. She says that will determine what actions they'll take against their rival. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is facing calls for multiple investigations. The next could be whether his office interfered in the DOJ's nursing home probe. Senator Chuck Grassley wants the attorney general to investigate whether any state officials obstructed the DOJ's COVID-19 nursing home probe. It comes after a data disclosure revealed that nearly 15,000 nursing home residents in New York State died of the virus. That's almost double the amount previously made known. The New York Post reported last week that Governor Cuomo's top aide admitted to hiding nursing home data so the feds wouldn't find out. And New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is calling for a separate investigation. It follows reports that Cuomo's vaccine czar Larry Schwartz is contacting county executives to gauge their loyalty amid the governor's sexual harassment probe. If vaccine supply is being given out for political reasons, uh, that in many ways is the single worst thing we've heard on all of these scandals. And they're all horrible. Schwartz told the Post he did not discuss vaccines in the conversations and that he did nothing wrong. But de Blasio said if true, the action is the definition of corruption. On top of the investigation of the nursing home scandal, the investigation of the sexual harassment and molestation, but now on top of it, there needs to be an investigation of why a senior official in the governor's office clearly tried to link vaccine supply to political support. Cuomo is facing allegations that he sexually harassed or behaved inappropriately towards six women. He denies touching any women inappropriately. The White House press secretary discussed the accusations Monday. Uh, We find them troubling. The president finds them troubling, hard to read. Um, And uh, every woman uh, who steps forward needs to be treated with dignity uh, and respect. She says New York's attorney general is pursuing an independent investigation into Cuomo. And the president believes that's appropriate, as is the vice president. Uh, the investigation needs to be both quick and thorough, consistent with how serious these allegations are. On Sunday, President Biden said he wants to see the results of the investigation before commenting on whether Cuomo should resign. There are more unaccompanied children crossing the border, with over 4,000 now reportedly in Border Patrol custody. NTD's Miguel Moreno has that story and more from a border town in Texas. Not even a week ago, Border Patrol reportedly detained over 3,200 children at the U.S.-Mexico border, all without their parents. 
Now, according to CBS and CNN, that number's gone up by 1,000, 4,200 total. Border Patrol got back to us, but they neither confirmed nor denied those reports. So we're here in the Rio Grande. We came down here to get a feel for the area and speak with Texans about the influx of illegal border crossings. In the border town of Loreto, attorney Nelly Viama has practiced law for 20 years, specializing in immigration. You know, as an, as an attorney, we follow the law. There's laws in process and we have to follow that. She says she's worried about the surge in illegal border crossings. For one, Vilma says the community's safety is at risk when immigrants infected with COVID-19 enter the country. Secondly, criminal cartels profit from the flow of human lives. Uh, what seems to happen is that the people in Central America got the wrong message, perhaps by the cartels, because of course they're making money with this. Um, and I hear this from the other side, so I have a very balanced perspective because one of my sons is a border patrol, so he's stationed in the Donna uh, station. And those are the stories that he hears from these families, you know, that, oh, well, they said that we can come, that Biden is going to help us. And it looks like business is booming for cartels. Check out this video taken at the border on March 11th, courtesy of Tripwires and Triggers. A thick line of migrants await their turn to illegally cross into the U.S. According to Reuters, Mexican President Obrador says they need to regulate the flow of migrants because that business can't be tackled in a day. Loreto residents say the border isn't just the U.S.'s responsibility. Each government should take responsibility. Everybody tries to protect their borders, so, I mean, I understand that too, but, I mean, I mean, you got to protect that too, I mean. Sometimes I feel like it's Mexico's responsibility, not so much the U.S.'s. I think in Mexico there aren't a lot of jobs over there. Well, the people have to find them. That's why they come. That's why we came, because there aren't many opportunities there like the ones here. For Sandra Witten, a Texas Republican and former congressional candidate, the border crisis hits home. Her husband's a Border Patrol agent. We've seen all the outbreaks, whether it was COVID-19, whether it's been scabies or fleas or chicken pox or, you know, H1N1. All of this stuff comes across the border, but nobody stops to think about the agents. Where you see all of these newscasts about, oh, what about all these people who have made the decision to come into the country illegally? We have to make sure that their health is taken care of. A day after this interview, Governor Greg Abbott said the Biden administration agreed to offer Border Patrol COVID-19 vaccines after months of inaction. That's supposed to start this week. A reporter asked White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki if Mexico was doing enough to stem the flow of illegal immigrants crossing into the U.S. She said more could be done, but didn't say what more they could do. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, Laredo. And the fence surrounding the Capitol building will start coming down next week. The Senate Sergeant at Arms said that there is no credible threat that warrants using it any longer. The fence has drawn controversy for weeks from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. One Democrat congresswoman from D.C., Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, even introduced a bill to prohibit federal funds from paying for a permanent fence around Capitol Hill. The fence currently costs about $1.2 million per week. Starting Monday, the razor wire will be taken down and new positioning will allow pedestrian access. But fencing will remain around Capitol Square. A judge may allow an absentee ballot inspection in Georgia's Fulton County. That area was the focus of controversy in the state during the 2020 election. Here's more on the details. Voter watchdogs may finally get to see absentee ballots from Fulton County. Georgia Supreme Court Judge Brian O'Mara says he's inclined to release the ballots to investigators. Voting integrity advocates sued to see the ballots. They say that fraud and irregularities occurred in Fulton County during the 2020 election. A video from Fulton County shows workers counting ballots late into the night after observers left. Observers say they were told to leave by election officials. Georgia election officials deny that happened. Garland Farverito runs a voting integrity group and is part of the lawsuit. He says voters want to know the truth. Everybody wants to know. Uh, if the ballots are, are real or not, and, and who won the Georgia electoral votes. Joven Hutton Pulitzer testified in the Georgia state legislator following the 2020 election. He says viewing the paper ballots is the key to figuring out if there was fraud or not. Amaro says he wants the process to shed light and dispel rumors. He says he won't sign the order until the integrity of the ballots is assured. He says the inspection may start in April. 
The Washington Post is walking back claims that former President Trump told Georgia's elections investigator to, quote, find the fraud. They admit the article falsified quotes attributed to Trump, but issued no apology. NTD's Christina Kim has more. The Washington Post says in an update that Trump did not tell the investigator to find the fraud or say she would be a national hero if she did so. The March 11th update is added to the story that was originally published in January. Instead, Trump urged the investigator to scrutinize Fulton County, where he said they would find dishonesty. According to Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and his officials, Fulton County had many issues during the 2020 election. A number of Democrat lawmakers cited the fake quotes to push for Trump's impeachment. And CNN, Reuters, ABC, NBC and the Associated Press reported the falsified quotes, citing a single anonymous source. As of today, only CNN updated its article, saying the earlier version had a paraphrasing of Trump's comments. Critics say this illustrates the severe problem with the media's lack of accountability. Mark Hemingway, a senior writer at Real Clear Investigations, said this mistake is beyond serious for corporate media that, quote, insist they're the ones holding the line on the truth. While others, like MSNBC writer Hayes Brown, say corrections are good and what would be corrupt is if they never issued a correction. Some say the specific quote was not accurate, but the overall narrative that Trump pressured election officials stands true. Christina Kim, NTD News. Trump responded, saying he appreciates the Washington Post's correction, but that the original story was a hoax right from the beginning. Trump also says he'd appreciate further investigation into Fulton County. Critical race theory has been making its way into school studies and staff trainings. People are told to examine their whiteness and put people into either racist or anti-racist categories. NTD's Christina Kim speaks to one professor who's speaking out. Professor Aaron Kinsvater recently made waves with a video he posted on YouTube. In it, he pushes against the dominance of critical race theory. The professor teaches in the graduate counseling program at the University of Vermont, specializing in adult learning and mental health. Critical race theory looks at society through a racial lens, specifically how to grapple with the, quote, history of white supremacy. Kinsvater emphasizes that he never means to dismiss any discrimination people face. He made the video because he's concerned how the teachings would impact school policy and his students and the people they counsel. After posting the video, he received backlash from the school's administration. They said he was anti-diversity, equity and inclusion and asked how he would respond to concerns that he was a member of an alt-right cult. Another administrator contacted me today and suggested that uh, uh, my videos indicate that I need therapy. Kinsvater says racism is a complex and nuanced topic. But when it's boiled down to a black and white issue where people are either racist or anti-racist, good or evil, this prevents honest and constructive discussions and results in emotional reactions, including depression and anxiety. He describes a teach-in called Turning Towards Whiteness, which reportedly linked a number of societal ills to white people and says the school has accepted and pushed these teachings. Critical race theory is reflected in the diversity, equity, and inclusion standards that we're being asked, well, required really, to introduce into each of our classes. So Kinsvater introduced critical race theory in his own way. He presents the theory alongside voices that challenge the ideology. But because he showed different viewpoints, Kinsvater says he was the object of what he calls two struggle sessions, a communist tactic to publicly shame people for their views. The administration called the alternative viewpoints in Kinsvater's course harmful, but never defined what harm means. We're not playing the definition game, we're playing the power game. And the term harm is used like a cudgel to gain compliance with the ideology. His students, however, have been open to discussion. Professor Kinsvater says those who oppose critical race theory only do so in a whispered way because they fear the backlash. But he says it doesn't mean someone is racist because they question the ideology. He encourages people to meet others with different views. Doing so can do wonders and help move our country forward, he says. Christina Kim, NTD News. A top official at Facebook says the company has too much power and should be broken up. That's according to a video that Project Veritas just released. Here are the details. Benny Thomas, Facebook's global planning lead, told an undercover journalist about the company and its CEO. 
Thomas said Facebook and its CEO Mark Zuckerberg have too much power, and he said the government needs to step in to limit the damage the big tech giant does to society. The government needs to step in and break up Google and Facebook. It's a better thing for the world. Instagram, Facebook, Messenger, Oculus, um, WhatsApp, they all need to be separate companies. It's too much power when they're all one to one. Facebook hasn't responded yet to a request for comment. Thomas said Zuckerberg should be removed as CEO and that Facebook and Google are as big as countries. No king in the history of the world has been the ruler of two billion people. But Mark Zuckerberg is. <laughs> and he's 36. Well, that's too much for a 36 year old. Like, you should not be. You should not have power over two billion people. I just think that's wrong. Thomas's LinkedIn shows he's worked at Facebook in New York for about a year and a half. The Federal Trade Commission and a group of state attorneys general have sued the social media giant in major antitrust lawsuits. But, so you might say, oh, Facebook's being sued. You know what? That case is going to drag on for years and years. Like, like, it's just going to go on and on in court because Facebook has all the money in the world, so does the U.S. government. They'll just keep fighting, you know? That thing's going to happen for a long time. Thomas said he is concerned that the public may not be aware of just how powerful Facebook is. Thomas admitted that he worked on a Facebook project that helped register four and a half million voters. And he said he believes Joe Biden benefited from the effort. And among those two billion people on Facebook, a small group of Christian evangelists met with an unpleasant surprise when their Facebook page was censored. They say they can't figure out why. NTD's Don Tran has that story. Christians have been ministering and spreading the gospel for millennia, but one ministry in Milwaukee, Wisconsin does their work online. The United Fellowship of Jesus was founded in 2013 by Nick and Leslie Rich. Nick says social media has played a large role in helping him reach out to the brokenhearted and people in need. I had a guy that was going to commit suicide, um, and I was able to minister to him and talk him out of it and encourage him and explain to him what he had to live for. And to look at the good and positive things instead of looking at the negative. Over the last nine months, Nick's ministry has been growing on Facebook, but the social media giants blocked him from posting his religious services and from going live. They said he violated their policy on spamming. They also directed him to their community standards, which shows several traits that they consider spamming, but they didn't specify which of these traits they found in his content. And it also, within those community standards, goes to the point of threatening that I could be actually deactivated off of Facebook uh, as the ultimate uh, thing, uh, when I've I've done nothing to affect anyone's safety or, or harm anyone except for tell the truth and uh, try to give people hope in the midst of uh, this pandemic. Nick says he's not the only Christian being blocked and restricted by Facebook. Other people from online ministries have also been penalized by Facebook for invalid reasons or for seemingly no reason at all. Nick says it's an act of religious discrimination. Christians come on and they preach, they put on scriptures, videos that are to help people. Um, they're ministering and evangelizing. They get hit and banned for 10 or 15 days. You're affecting my ministry at the same time because now I can't go live on Facebook and I can't be able to reach those people. And what if that person commits suicide that my ministry was just trying to connect with? Nick says America was built on freedom of speech, and it's a principle that's slowly being eroded today. We contacted Facebook for comments, but they did not respond. Don Tran, NTD News. We have an update on the dispute between Facebook and News Corp in Australia. The tech giant has agreed to pay News Corp Australia for news content from its local providers. Here are the details. Facebook said it's reached a deal with Rupert Murdoch's News Corp in Australia on Tuesday. It's the next step to settle a dispute, which briefly blacked out the social network's news feeds across the country. It also makes News Corp the first major media outlet to strike a deal with Facebook under controversial new laws that make Facebook and Google pay Australian publishers for their content. If they fail to do so, the new law lets the Australian government step in and force them to pay fees. 
In a statement, News Corp CEO Robert Thompson called the deal a landmark in transforming the terms of trade for journalism and said it would have a material and meaningful impact on our Australian news businesses. Facebook's one-week blackout in Australia last month sparked a storm of criticism, as the shutdown also affected not only news, but emergency services and public health pages. But the social media giant ultimately dropped its ban when Australia agreed to soften some parts of the new regulations. Like Facebook, Google had also objected to the new laws and threatened to withdraw from Australia. But it changed tack and signed deals with most media outlets, including News Corp, in the days leading up to the law. TV broadcaster and newspaper publisher Seven West Media previously said it intends to strike a Facebook deal. And rival Nine Entertainment announced Tuesday it had signed a letter of intent as well. A Facebook spokesperson declined to comment on the Nine negotiations. Just ahead, in New York City, candidates are preparing for the upcoming primaries in a bid to become the city's next mayor. A well-known figure launched his campaign as a Republican. And parents and children are marching to reopen schools in San Francisco. They say the current online schooling is neither fun nor effective. Find out more in just a minute. The Texas State Senate approves a bill to cut about $5.1 billion in disputed electricity fees. This will help the state's power market recover after a winter freeze sent it into financial crisis. Last month's cold snap pushed up normal electricity costs by nearly 10 times. The extra costs led three companies to bankruptcy and sparked a battle between lawmakers and the state's power regulator. The measure directs the state's utility manager and grid operator to correct 32 hours of emergency prices and roll back service fees. But it still needs approval by the state's House of Representatives and the governor. Last month's weather crisis cut power to some 4.3 million people in the state and caused over 50 deaths. In New York City, candidates are preparing for the upcoming primaries in in a bid to become the city's next mayor. Today, a Republican officially started his campaign. NTD's Colin Fredrickson has the story. Curtis Sliwa officially launched his campaign today at Penn Station. Sliwa founded the Guardian Angels, a 40-year-old organization that patrols the city at night to prevent crime. He will run under the slogan, Save Our City. One thing they universally agree on is that crime is completely out of control. Sliwa wants to make the city safer by refunding the police. He also promised to support them in other ways and to work together with them closely. His relationship with the police wasn't always as good as it is now. They didn't support the idea of the Guardian Angels when they were first founded in 1979. The NYPD was no friend of ours and I got locked up 76 times. He says his experience on New York City streets and with the police over four decades means he would be a down-to-earth mayor. And a mayor who rides the subways every day not just for a photo opportunity. His other priorities would be to bring businesses and tourism back to New York and to clean up the subway. Sliwa says he would be the third Republican mayor to serve the city after Giuliani and Bloomberg. Colin Fredrickson, NTD News, New York. A small plane collided with a car in Florida, leaving the aircraft's two passengers and a boy inside an SUV dead. The aftermath footage shows the aircraft skidding and bursting into flames though it was captured in a most unusual way. This clip was captured by a ring security camera. That's right, a doorbell cam. It shows the plane breaking apart and going up in flames after plowing nose first into the vehicle. Authorities say the aircraft went down soon after a 3 p.m. takeoff from the North Perry Airport in Pembroke Pines. The plane also reportedly took out a power line on its way down. It's unclear what caused the crash. An investigation is underway. It's been over a year since most California public schools closed. Over the weekend, many parents and students held a statewide march and rally calling for the schools to reopen. NTD's David Zhang has more from San Francisco. 
About 300 parents and kids marched from the iconic Alamo Square in San Francisco to City Hall on Saturday. Many attendees wore yellow t-shirts that say, decreasing the distance. They are calling for full reopening of schools. I miss my teachers and I miss my friends. And when I stare at the screen for so long, it makes me, my eyes feel all groggy. No more zoomies. No more zoomies. I'm here for students, my students and also my child. Both of these girls have been online learning, and I think that over time, turning off their video and muting their mic, that the participation has just gone down, and it's just very difficult to learn. I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy online school. It doesn't make me happy. Hey, hey, feel me. Meanwhile, our school district has become a national embarrassment. In San Francisco, supposedly an equity-focused, progressive city, we are among the last to reopen our schools. Now as one in four San Franciscans has received the vaccine, including our teachers, one year it's time for us to <laughs> bookend that and get all of our students back into school. Several local elected officials attended the rally where there was a sense of optimism. Maybe we can get at least our elementary school kids back into school before the end of the school year. Hey, maybe we can open up some summer schools. Maybe we can make sure that all kids, high school, middle school, and elementary school start back this fall. However, there are still many hurdles before the district and teacher union officials can reach an agreement for school reopening. Some say it could take until at least this fall to achieve full reopening for grades K-12 to statewide. Reporting by David Zhang, NTD News, San Francisco. California's Governor Gavin Newsom is trying to put a stop to his own recall. This after more than two million people signed a petition to challenge Newsom in a special election before his term ends. The California governor claims the recall is a partisan effort backed by Republicans, anti-vaxxers, QAnon conspiracy theorists, and anti-immigration -Trump, anti Trump supporters. And he asked his Twitter followers to help stop the movement. The California Democratic Party also announced it is contributing $250,000 to the Stop the Republican Recall campaign. But the spokesperson of the Recall Gavin 2020 campaign says it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. It's because residents are unhappy with the state's ongoing lockdowns, high poverty and homeless rates, and high income taxes. Chicago's river is shamrock green. The city is carrying on the tradition of dyeing the river green to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. NTD's Don Tran has more. Since the tradition was canceled, it seemed Chicago would go a second year without dyeing its river green. But the city is enjoying a pleasant surprise. Mayor Lightfoot revealed on social media the city's river is flowing green once again. Yeah, it's great. We're really excited to see it for the first time. We'd heard about it and, and not seen it before, so it's neat to see. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. I love it. It's cool. It's, it's incredibly green. It makes me want to jump into it, which is crazy because I can't swim. The tradition honors St. Patrick, Ireland's patron holy figure. Some are concerned the dying of the river is harmful to the environment. One bystander said it's just food coloring. I don't think the river itself, even without coloring, is something really good to, as a, you can drink it directly or like swim or do whatever activities. So I don't think it makes make any real harm for, for the wildlife or whatever. Even though there won't be a parade this year, the city is still able to carry on one tradition. The official day to celebrate St. Patrick is March 17th. Don Tran, NTD News. And coming up, a Chinese company is giving up its majority control over AMC. This after the movie theater chain suffered a record loss of over $4 billion. And suspicion grows in Europe towards the Chinese Communist Party and its dealings in EU member countries. But the CCP is growing bolder in its influence operations. All that and more on NTD News. If you're like me, and I think it's actually most of us, then you're getting really fed up with the nonsense going on inside the banking system. I mean, we've worked hard our entire lives to retire comfortably. We just recovered from the crash of 2008, and it seems like it's about to happen all over again. Look at the too big to fail banks. They're only getting bigger as the Fed hands them trillions of dollars daily, 
while simple folks like you and me, we're only getting the short end of the stick. That's why I'm glad I found this book called The Bank Failure Survival Guide. Give us a call and we'll send you a free copy with no obligations whatsoever, just one American to another, telling you about some options that you might not have considered. Call 866-239-2619 today for your free copy of the Bank Failure Survival Guide. That's 866-239-2619. The glory of piano masterpieces from the Baroque, Classical, and Romantic periods. New Tang Dynasty Television invites you to join the 2021 NTD International Piano Competition. Together, we preserve and revitalize the art of authentic classical piano music. October 2021 in New York City. Register now at piano.ntdtv.com. Someone has to find the way to build the Great Dome. Completely new, completely original. A U.S. judge pauses a ban on Chinese phone maker Xiaomi. The company was originally blocked from American investment to stop U.S. funding from going towards developing the Chinese military. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. A Chinese company is giving up its majority control over the world's largest movie theater chain. According to its recent financial statements, American movie theater chain AMC suffered a record loss of over $4 billion. This is because it had to close its theaters in response to the CCP virus pandemic. Its Chinese owner, Dalian Wanda Group, recently sold and converted many shares of AMC. Wanda earned over 20 percent of AMC's shares by the end of last year, and it was AMC's largest shareholder. Now, Wanda owns less than 10 percent. Wanda's founder, Wang Jianling, was once the richest man in China. At the same time, he is a member of the Chinese Communist Party. His company, Wanda, acquired AMC with over $2 billion nearly a decade ago. The acquisition made Congress concerned about the Chinese regime's growing influence on entertainment. A U.S. judge has temporarily halted a ban that blocks Americans from investing in a Chinese smartphone maker. The Defense Department imposed the ban in January, which bars all American investment in any companies blacklisted by the Defense Department. Chinese phone maker Xiaomi was added to that blacklist, based on alleged links to the Chinese military. That means U.S. investors must divest all holdings in the company before November this year. The Trump administration said the ban would prevent American investors from funding China's military development. It takes aim at the country's military and civil fusion strategy, a tactic that employs private companies to help develop military technology. And these private companies often raise capital by selling securities to American investors. That's as China's military poses a growing threat to U.S. national security. Xiaomi has denied having ties to Chinese military, and it took the Defense Department to court over the blacklist. But the Defense Department cites two reasons for the label. First, Xiaomi's founder received an award from a Chinese regime agency in 2019. It's the same agency responsible for managing Beijing's military fusion effort. The agency gives out the award only once every five years and only to top private entrepreneurs. Only 100 people received the award in 2019. The second focuses on Xiaomi's technological ambitions. Xiaomi has entered the 5G era. The company plans to invest almost $8 billion in the 5G development in artificial intelligence. The Defense Department says that technology is of key interest to the Chinese regime and a focus for Beijing's military civil fusion strategy. Xiaomi says its pleas was the judge's decision and says it will work to permanently remove itself from the blacklist. Chinese-owned factories were set ablaze outside the largest city in Burma, and also known as Myanmar. 
security forces responded with violence and declared martial law in the area. The factory fires were entangled in the weeks of protests directed at the ruling military junta. The suburb outside the country's capital city is home to multiple Chinese-owned factories. Amid the uproar, the Chinese regime called on Burmese authorities to protect Chinese property and staff. Burma is currently under a military junta's rule after a recent coup. The junta is seen as friendly towards Beijing. Voice of America reports that Burma's security forces killed at least 39 people on Sunday. It's the deadliest day since the February 1st coup. The junta took power after claiming widespread election fraud. The Assistance Association for Political Prisoners says over 120 people have so far been killed since the junta took over. If you are wondering just what goes on behind closed doors in China's ruling communist regime, especially in the last year or so, you're not alone. Europeans are growing increasingly distrustful of the regime. NTD's France correspondent David Vives speaks with a senator to shed some light on this. For more than 10 years, French Senator André Gatoulin worked on France's foreign policies, where he observed the CCP and its impact in Asia and in Europe. He says recently he has noticed significant changes within the French government. People I warned about the CCP's influence 10 years ago used to tell me I was paranoid. Today, some ministers and high-level officials I speak with in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs seem distrustful and suspicious towards China. Gatolin says there are several telling examples of that. One is Confucius Institutes closing down in various universities across Europe. In the Netherlands, two Confucius institutes have recently been closed over suspicion of spy activities from the CCP. It seems the CCP thought it would be easy, but that's not the case. In the UK, former universities minister Joe Johnson warned of poorly understood risks regarding to the close ties between UK universities and China. A report from the King's College and Harvard Kennedy School says the Chinese partnership with UK higher education and research raises pressing questions for policymakers at a time of rising geopolitical tensions. This doesn't seem to stop CCP's commitment over its collaboration with universities across Europe. Gatolin says Chinese officials CCP are bolder than ever when they approach French officials and in what they are asking from them in their attempts to influence decision-making. The CCP is getting more aggressive and bold. Though it's quite easy to close the Confucius Institute, it's harder to stop the CCP's attempts to influence the universities through the networks it's in and the funding it gives. A poll published in November 2020 shows that around 70% of people in France have negative or very negative feeling towards the Chinese regime. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. And still to come, Bitcoin ATMs appear in New York City. They're cropping up in cities across the U.S., but with one major disadvantage compared to traditional ATMs. Find out more when we come back. A new feature is appearing at smoke shops in Montana, gas stations in the Carolinas, and delis in far-flung corners of New York City a brightly lit Bitcoin ATM where customers can buy or sell digital currency and sometimes extract hard cash. Here's our latest financial and business news on jobs in the economy. New York City bodega is already famous for consumers being able to buy just about anything, anytime, day or night. And now, Bitcoins are added to the list. Bitcoin ATMs are popping up in the city and around the country in corner stores, delis, gas stations, and other easy access consumer outlets. Fueled by a frenzy in crypto trading that recently sent Bitcoin prices to a record high above $60,000 a pop. New York City deli owner Gamal Yaha doesn't even understand what Bitcoin is, but he does understand what it means for his bottom line. It brings a lot of people to the store, more people come into the store, people, people use the Bitcoin, they, use the, they buy some stuff too from the store, and it brings more business. So it's very good for the business. Kiosk operators like CoinFlip and CoinCloud have installed thousands of Bitcoin ATMs, and executives say they are scouting out other spots in areas where their competitors have yet to reach. 
Chris Yim is CEO and co-founder of Liberty X, which provides the software for Bitcoin ATMs. He says his product is helping to bring the complex world of Bitcoin to the masses. So what we found is actually that a lot of these local delis, convenience stores, they actually have the best locations because they are centerpieces of their neighborhood. So they made very natural partners for us to go that extra and last mile. Users can buy or sell Bitcoins or a fraction using the ATM and send Bitcoins abroad all with anonymity. But it comes at a much steeper price than cash and a traditional ATM. Fees can range from 6% to 20% of a total transaction, according to cryptocurrency compliance firm CypherTrace. Government agencies say that raises red flags and there is concern about the potential for illicit activity. But that may not stop a Bitcoin ATM from popping up at a store near you. As of January, there were more than 28,000 Bitcoin ATMs in the United States, according to independent research site HowManyBitcoinATMs.com. More than one third of those were put in place just the last five months alone. Auto safety regulators are investigating a crash. During the, inc during the accident, a Tesla became wedged underneath a tractor trailer and left a passenger in critical condition. The National Highway Safety Administration said it, says it has sent investigators to look into the March 11th crash in Detroit. Local police say a white Tesla drove through an intersection and struck a trailer after 3 a.m. Both the driver and passenger were taken to a local hospital. The passenger was listed in critical condition. WDIV reported that the injured passenger was a 21-year-old woman. The Highway Safety Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board have probed other similar crashes where a Tesla struck a trailer. That includes two fatal crashes in Florida. A microchip shortage means some commuters will have to pay more at the pump. General Motors announced Monday some of its Chevrolet Silverados and GMC Sierras will not feature a fuel management module, which helps give better fuel mileage. The problem can't be fixed later by adding in a chip either. The chip shortage is affecting the entire auto industry. It started after vehicle makers cut back on computer chips thanks to an overall sales drop because of the pandemic. When that happened, tech companies started to hoard computer chips. In contrast, the tech sector saw a boost in sales due to increased demand for devices as many started working from home. That's why GM and others are having trouble finding chips. GM is offering a $50 discount off the cost of its affected vehicle as a consolation for the fuel issue. Do you go online to find better deals when shopping? If you do, you should watch out for these pricing traps. NTD's Evelyn Lee reports. Did you know retailers change prices depending on your location? For example, Target's app can tell if you're shopping inside the store or outside it, and it can change prices accordingly. If you are coming within proximity to a store and you're looking at prices online, you may notice that those prices jump. But it may also differ for people who live in higher income areas or more expensive cities. It's a practice known as dynamic pricing. It's not unique to Target, and shoppers who don't know about it could end up paying more. Warwick says prices could change multiple times during a day. Time of day, demand, uh, location as well, like your zip code, if it's stored in your shopping account, all could affect how the retailer is going to target you with their prices. And they do it to compete against the online giants. According to Business Insider, Amazon changes prices about every 10 minutes. It collects data and can even use the words you highlight in a Kindle to analyze your shopping patterns. Pressured by this, many brick-and-mortar retailers have followed suit. I've noticed this across the board. I'm talking about Best Buy, Walmart, Target. But she says there are several ways you can avoid overpaying. You also can open up a private browser. This ensures that your cookies, so that might be past purchase data, history, and your location, aren't shared with the website that you're shopping at. And for mobile apps, she recommends turning off location sharing. Checking price histories of popular products. So sites like Amazon, they are kind of like a benchmark. A lot of retailers might base their prices on what Amazon is offering at that time. And there's a site called Camel, Camel, Camel that provides historical pricing data for many of the products. Other options are installing browser tools that compare and find the lowest prices for the product you're looking at or apply available coupon codes. 
You can also take advantage of price matching at many stores. That means you can request matching the in-store price tag with the cheaper price you found online. Evelyn Lee, NTD News. And coming up, protesters are rallying against a new bill they say would limit their right to protest. The head of London police says it's only stopping actions that interfere with policing and governance. Spain bursts into blossom as its fruit trees fill landscapes with color. This year, nature's beauty carries a deeper meaning for residents who endured a year of lockdowns. More on that when we return. Do you have a life insurance policy you no longer need? Now you can sell your policy, even a term policy, for an immediate cash payment. Call Coventry Direct to learn more. We thought we had planned carefully for our retirement. But we quickly realized we needed a way to supplement our income. Our friends sold their policy to help pay their medical bills. And that got me thinking. Maybe selling our policy could help with our retirement. I was skeptical. So I did some research and called Coventry Direct. They explained life insurance is a valuable asset that can be sold. We learned we could sell all of our policy or keep part of it with no future payments. Who knew? We sold our policy. Now we can relax and enjoy our retirement as we had planned. If you have $100,000 or more of life insurance, you may qualify to sell your policy. Don't cancel or let your policy lapse without finding out what it's worth. Visit CoventryDirect.com to find out if your policy qualifies or call 1-800-509-8500. Coventry Direct, redefining insurance. When you look at TV networks in America, A soundbite and fight-it-out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep-dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. Three European countries are suspending the AstraZeneca vaccine. That's after reports of dangerous blood clots in some of the recipients. But the company says there is no evidence the health problems are from the shot. Here are the details. Germany, France and Italy said Monday that they will be pausing their rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine after several countries reported possible serious side effects, throwing Europe's already struggling vaccination campaign into disarray. Denmark and Norway stopped giving the shot last week after reporting isolated cases of bleeding, blood clots and a low platelet count. Iceland and Bulgaria quickly followed suit along with Ireland and the Netherlands, which announced suspensions on Sunday. French President Emmanuel Macron said that the country will wait until guidance is issued from the European Union's medicine regulator, which is due Tuesday. The decision which has been taken out of precaution in conformity with our European policy is to suspend, by precaution, vaccinating with the AstraZeneca vaccine in the hope that we can resume quickly if the EMA gives the green light. The United Kingdom said it had no concerns over the vaccine, while Poland said it thought the benefits outweighed any risks. Londoners are protesting a new police bill. They say it will make it too easy to take away their right to peaceful protest. It follows recent clashes at a vigil for a young woman who was murdered. London police clamped down on protesters rallying against a new bill on Monday that critics say would give officers too much power to crush peaceful protest. Demonstrators convened on British Parliament as lawmakers debated. They blocked traffic on nearby Westminster Bridge before marching on to police headquarters and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's office. 
Monday's protests come on the heels of days of demonstrations over the kidnapping and murder of 33-year-old Sarah Everard, which has sparked global outrage over the failure to protect women's safety. A police officer, 48-year-old Wayne Cousins, has been charged with Everard's murder. Police broke up a vigil planned for Everard on Saturday, saying it breached lockdown rules and dragged away several mourners in what was widely seen as excessive force. Under Monday's proposed bill, police would be able to impose a start and end time for demonstrations, set a noise limit, and shut down protests that have a, quote, relevant impact on persons in the vicinity. London Met Police Chief Cressida Dick, who has rejected calls for her resignation over the protests, said the draft law would only target demonstrations that aim to, quote, bring policing to its knees and the city to a halt. But opponents say the law's deliberately vague language could be used to shut down almost any kind of protest. In a separate measure, British lawmakers introduced an amendment on Monday which would classify misogyny as a hate crime. Police in Spain seized the first narco submarine made in the country. The semi-submersible vessel is designed to smuggle nearly 4,500 pounds of drugs. According to a press release, the country's police found the vessel in a warehouse in southern Spain. It was discovered during an operation against a sophisticated drug smuggling ring that resulted in over 50 arrests. Semi-submersibles are hard to detect, but expensive to build. They have long been used by drug traffickers working in Latin America, but are thought to be much less common in Europe. The birth of a baby giraffe in one of Britain's zoos is cause for celebration for conservationists worldwide. It's estimated there are just 1,600 of its kind left in the world. A zoo in northern England celebrated the birth of a rare Rothschild giraffe and captured the new arrival on CCTV. Born at Chester Zoo on March 3rd, the male calf was already standing at six feet tall and weighed 154 pounds. After a 15 months pregnancy, Mother Orla delivered onto soft straw before the calf took his first wobbly steps. Giraffe experts say he will grow to be 18 feet and weigh over 2,000 pounds. Spain's fruit trees are bursting into a breathtaking view. As springtime approaches, hundreds of thousands of buds are in bloom. Orchards spread across 8,500 hectares of fields in Spain's Aitona, producing a riot of color. Thousands of tourists and locals head for the fields every spring to see the spectacle. But this season, the flowers have a deeper significance after a year of virus-related deaths and lockdowns halting normal life for most. Being here in a landscape as spectacular as this, it symbolizes the beginning of a new cycle. That is what we all hope for, that it is the beginning of a new cycle and that we have learned something positive from this year that has been very difficult. I wish the greatest happiness for everyone. We have learned to appreciate different things, not like what we appreciated before, material things, for example. Now we put more value on people and nature and landscapes like these. The trees yield an annual production of 330 million pounds of fruit, including peaches and pears. Coming up, a major breakthrough in piecing together the world's oldest mechanical computer. Researchers say it will show how the ancient Greeks saw the cosmos. Switzerland is known for its luxury watches, and now one of the country's most famous soccer players is trying his hand at the industry. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. Switzerland's former soccer captain Stefan Liechtsteiner still has his eye on the time. He's now training to become a watchmaker. Liechtsteiner made 108 appearances for the Swiss national side. His new interest is starting with a six-month internship at Zurich firm Maurice de Muriac. Yeah, first of all, it's a very nice experience for me because I like watches and uh, for all my life I played football and now to do a, a new experience with a, a, a very good team. It's every time good for the life to see new things, uh, to see how uh, you do the watch. He said he would make a watch during his internship to be sold for charity. Beyond that, he's open to the idea of becoming a full-time watchmaker, but hasn't decided for sure and might still go back to sports. 
No, why not? If I have the quality and we have a nice vision to do great things, uh, it can it can also it can also be it can also be that I go back uh, in a football. But uh, to be a real good mod watchmaker for me is also a possibility. The company's owners, Leonard and Massimo Dreyfus, said they were delighted to have Liechtsteiner on board as their first trainee. Leonard Dreyfus said the former soccer player was chosen over other applicants for his enthusiasm. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Researchers in the UK say they've made a major step in solving a mysterious ancient Greek astronomical device. They've created a new theoretical model that conforms to the physical evidence and matches inscriptions on the device itself. Researchers in the UK say they've solved a major piece of an ancient astronomical puzzle. They've made a new theoretical model of a 2,000-year-old astronomical calendar. The device was found in 1901 in a shipwreck off Greece. It's a very fundamental part of our technological history, and it takes back by a long, long time the origin of the ideas of making machines to calculate things. It could be the world's oldest mechanical computer. Its insides look like a clock. About 30 bronze gears were cranked to calculate phases of the moon, ellipses, and other celestial information. But only about a third of it survived. It's split into many pieces now. So actually piecing together what it did is a very difficult 3D jigsaw puzzle. In 2005, 3D x-rays revealed thousands of letters hidden inside the fragments. Freeth and his colleagues have now created a model that matches the physical pieces and written inscriptions. It displays how the ancient Greeks saw the cosmos, including the sun, moon, and planets. I think it is a major step, a major advance in our understanding of the mechanism, because it, it, it recreates what we believe was how, how the mechanism actually looked. And it's, it's a stunning representation of the cosmos. Researchers say it brings them one step closer to understanding the device's full capabilities and how accurately it predicted astronomical events. The idea of making a thing, a calculating machine with bronze gear wheels, says you can, dis, you can make those calculations with the turn of a hand. You don't need to do any complicated mathematics to calculate the consequences of your theoretical models of the, the cosmos, and this is a huge advance. Researchers say the next step is to remake the mechanism using ancient techniques. And that's all for now. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.